Good evening, family. Welcome this evening to Bible Way Community Baptist Church, the place where Jesus Christ is still the Lord of all and the Word of God still transform live. We're excited and delighted that you have tuned in to be a part of our Wednesday night broadcast. We hope and pray that you've been having a real good week and a real good day in the Lord. After all, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Listen, you have never seen the same day twice. God wake you up every morning to a brand new day. So give him thanks. Give him thanks. Our God is a God of newness. As a matter of fact, when we get into the kingdom and into eternity, God is going to be showing us new stuff all the time. And that's why you need to be working hard, ladies and gentlemen, trying to win as many Christians, uh, win as many sinners to Jesus Christ. Because you don't want nobody to miss it. You don't want nobody to miss what God has in store for us all. All right, well, let's get ready to start Bible study. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our Bible study time together this evening. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for who you are, the God who hear and you still answer prayer. Speak to our hearts now in a mighty way. Lead me, guide me, and direct me in all that I say and do so that honor and glory can be ascribed to your holy and righteous name. Give me teaching grace, give your people hearing grace, and then give us all doing grace. And we'll be careful to praise you for it. In Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. All right, we're going to start a new series tonight. We're going to start a new series. We're going to be looking at God. We're going to be looking at God. And this is lesson one. This is lesson one. And our first lesson that we're going to be looking at tonight is how do we know that God exists? How do we know? How do we know for sure that God Almighty exists? And so uh, we're going to be answering that question tonight. And... Uh, for the next few weeks, we're going to be studying about God. We're going to be looking at God. You know, I heard a story about uh, a little boy was playing there at the church and uh, the pastor saw this little boy. And this was a little bad little boy. <laughs> Him and his brother was noted for being two little bad boys in the community. So. The pastor looked at this little boy and said, come here, boy, come to my office. And so the little boy was kind of nervous. He went in the pastor's office. The pastor sat down at the desk. And the pastor said, I'm a, I got one question I want to ask you. Where is God? And the little boy, he didn't know. You know, he, he, he just sat there and he was froze. And the pastor asked him again, said, let me ask you again. Where is God? And the little boy, I mean, he was trembling. He was scared to death. Then the pastor leaned across the desk and looked the boy eyeball to eyeball. And he says, where is God? And the little boy was scared to death. He jumped up. Ran out the pastor's office, ran out the church, ran home and called his brother, bruh, 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 and found his brother and said, oh, man, we in trouble now. He said, what you talking about? He said, man, I was down there at the church playing with the rest of the kids down there at the church, and the pastor called me in the office, and the pastor asked me, where is God? And see, they think that we done stole God. They done lost God at the church and they think we done stole him. <laughs> oh, ladies and gentlemen, do you know 
The problem with our world today, our world done lost God. Yeah, they done lost God. They don't know where God is and they uh, don't even know that God even exists. And every problem in our world can be traced back to people don't have God. They done lost God. And that's, that's what we're going to do tonight. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to try to help you. Uh, because people, uh, they don't even believe that God exists. And then we have Christians don't know how to tell them that God exists. And so that's what we want to do today. Uh, we want to help you uh, and equip you with the information to answer that question. How do we know that God exists? I want to give you four ways today that uh, you can tell people uh, how we know that God exists. First of all, we know that God exists by intuition knowledge. By intuition knowledge. By intuition knowledge. Uh, human intuition. You don't heard of that. Human intuition. Uh, what is that? Uh, it is the direct knowledge of the awareness of something without conscious attention or reasoning. Uh, in intuition knowledge, is that which is normal or uh, the natural mind assumed to be true. It's just stuff that you know without even having to think about it. For instance, you know that there is time. You know that there is eternity. You know that there is space. You know for every cause there is an effect. You know that there is right and wrong. Uh, even in mathematic demonstration, you know if you uh, uh, start adding stuff together like one plus one, that, that equals two. You know you got more than one. Yeah, you just know. Uh, uh, Self-existent, you pinch yourself, you know you him. Yeah, that's just nobody have to tell you that you here. You just know that you <laughs> that you here. Uh, the existence of matter. You know that they, when you look at that table, if uh, that table, you know that it's here. If you it's the chair that you sitting in, nobody have to tell you you sitting in a chair. Yeah, you know you sitting on something. You may not know exactly what to call it, but but you know. That, that you sitting on something. You know if you watching television, you know that you watching television. You know that uh, uh, if you looking at me tonight on the computer, uh, nobody have to tell you that you watching me on, you just know that's intuition knowledge. That's intuition knowledge. And listen, man come here knowing that there is a God. Did you hear what I say? Man come here knowing that there is a God. How do I know? Because God put it in him. Look here at Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 23. It said, because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible thing of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Listen, did you notice that? Because when they knew God, there was a time that man knew God. They glorified him not as God, 
neither was thankful, but became vain in their imagination. And their foolish hearts was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became a fool. God didn't create a fool. Man became a fool and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds and four-footed beasts and creeping thing. Because man rejected the true God, he done came up with other gods. He come up with an other religious system to believe in other things besides the true and the living God. But when man came here, through intuition and knowledge, man knew that there was a God. Yeah, yeah. But when man rejected God, the true God, now he's coming up with all other kind of things, such as polytheism. Polytheism. What is polytheism? That's the belief in many gods. So when you go to different third world countries, not only do they believe in the true God, but they believe in just many gods, a whole bunch of gods. So now man done went too far. Uh, see, when you reject the true God, you're going to either go too far on one hand or you're not going to go far at all on the other hand. Like take, for instance, evolution. Evolution, that's the theory. Now notice, evolution is not a fact. It's the, the theory that all form of life originated by descent from earlier forms of nature. In this system, God is not even necessary. So evolution don't believe in God. Polytheism believe in too many gods. So you go from one extreme to the next one. And then you got something called a pantheism. Pantheism, what is pantheism? That's the belief that God is impersonal and identical with nature itself. So God, in other words, God is in everything and that everything is God. You probably heard that phrase before, that God is everything and that everything is God. <laughs> so uh, people, they worship the rocks. People, because that's God. But people worship the uh, river because that's God. People worship the trees because that's God. And so everything that you see, people, they are worshiping it because they look at that as God. God is in everything and everything is in God. And so you see people go from one extreme to the next extreme when you don't believe in the God of the Bible. But through intuition knowledge, uh, you know that there is a God. But notice what the Bible says in Romans, uh, not Romans, um, Psalm 14 and 1. It says, the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. Yeah, see the fool go around saying that there is no God. And so, uh, uh, a lot of these evolutionists, they're just showing themselves as a fool. They may have a PhD, but that's a PhD with a fool. You know, that's a fool. Uh, they may be a bachelor, may have a master's degree, but they are a fool with a master's and a bachelor degree. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says, man willfully rejected the truth of God by holding it down. Uh, Note it uh, over in Romans chapter one again, uh, how man has suppressed the truth, how man hold the truth down. And notice, I want you to see in Romans chapter one, verse 18, 23, 25, 28, and 32, all of them are active verbs. And, and, and notice they have the same thing in common. Look at Romans 1, 18. It says, who hold the truth in unrighteousness or who uh, 
suppress the truth or hold down the truth. That's an active verb. They are holding the truth down. Man don't want the truth to get out that there is a God. Romans 1.23 and changed the glory of the incorruptible God. See, man knew that there was a real God, but he changed it into an incorruptible God. Look here in Romans 1.25, who exchange, again, an active verb, the truth of God into a lie. They uh, Notice, man done exchange thing. There's an exchange. Man took the lie, Satan's lie, and uh, had exchanged that for the truth. So man done exchange. He done exchange. Romans 1 28. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So they, uh, they, they didn't want God in their mind. They got rid of God. Yeah, that's why I said earlier, man done lost God. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't want God in my mind. I don't want God in my thinking. See, man want a God that he can control. He don't want a, a God that can control him. Yeah, he don't want that. So he come up with something else that he can you know, worship beside the true and the living God. Uh, Romans 1, 32, who knowing the judgment of God. See, the reason they want to get rid of God is now I can get rid of God's judgment. I don't have to think about God's judgment. That's why people say, I don't believe in God. Now they don't believe in hell. Because see, uh, if there is a God that's in heaven, then there's got to be a hell. But people don't want to think about hell. So I don't want to think about God because God going to remind me of the judgment of God. But if I can get rid of God, if I can suppress that truth about God, then I don't have to think about the judgment of God, you see. And so uh, that's what man has, is doing today, who knowing the judgment of God. Then Romans 2, 14 says, watch this. It says, for when the Gentiles who have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not a law are a law to themselves, who shows the work of the law written in their heart. Is that in your Bible? It's written in their heart. Their conscience also bear witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. Listen, what it's saying here, you can go into the most heathen part of the world. But even in the most heathen part of the world, they know thou shall not steal. They know that thou shall not kill. Even though they ain't got no Bible. Even though they ain't got no written Ten Commandments like God gave Moses. They know that it's wrong to steal. They know it's wrong to kill. They know it's wrong to take another man's wife and, and, and sleep with her. They know that it's wrong to lie on another person. How do they know that? They ain't got no Ten Commandments. Not on the outside, but they got the Ten Commandments on the inside. On their heart. They got God's law. And because they got God's law, they know that it is a God. They know it. They know that it is a God. That's intuition knowledge. Even though they don't have a Bible, they don't know, uh, 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 you know, no Ten Commandments, but they got them all written on their heart. Why is that? God wrote it on their heart. Man, come here, stamped with the image of God. And that's another lesson we're going to talk about later on, how man is created in the image of God. And so uh, that's the first thing. The first way that we know that there is a God is through intuition knowledge. You just come here knowing 
that there is a God. Yeah. But the second is there are four traditional arguments. There are four traditional arguments that a lot of theologians, they normally refer to these arguments. If you went to Bible college, uh, and I won't get uh, too deep in them, I'll just you know, more or less give you a statement about them, but we won't cause, uh, uh, talk too long about them because we could go for hours just on uh, these four arguments. But first, there is something called the cosmological argument, the cosmological argument. And what that is, is the fact that every effect must have a cause. So the universe is the effect, then God must be the cause of such great universe. Yeah, for every effect, there's a cause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you see a car, somebody must uh, made that car. You see the effect, now the cause. Somebody must have made it. Uh, uh, Genesis 1 and 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Notice the scripture just on verse number one, as soon as you open your Bible, we don't have no introduction of God. It just assumes that God already exists. And notice God tells you how this universe got. He said, I did it. God says, I did it. I created the heavens and the earth. That's what God is saying. God, we see the effect. We see this earth. We see the sky. God says, I did all that. Yeah. In the beginning, God created. Uh, the Bible also says over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number three, through faith, we understand the world was framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God did it. God, the stuff that we see, God just spoke it into existence. He just spoke it. So we see the effect. And God says, I caused it. I caused it. The son, God says, I did that. You see the son, God said, I did it. Uh, you, uh, the moon, God says, I did it. The stars, he says, I did it. This earth, everything on this earth, the trees, uh, the fruit, all the, I did it. I did it. So you see, so that's the cosmological argument. And cosmos basically means world. Cosmos basically means world. So you see the cosmological argument. Then you have the... Uh, uh, Teleological, the teleological argument. The teleological argument basically says the fact that every design must have a designer. Since the universe was designed with a purpose, there must be an intelligent and a purposeful God. So here you see for every design, it's got to be a designer. Uh, the clearest verse in the Bible on that is Psalms 49, I'm sorry, Psalms 94, verses 9 and 10. It says, he who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eyes, shall he not see? He who chastened the nations, shall not he correct? And he who teaches man knowledge shall not he know. And so for every design, there is a designer. So you see your ear, there must be somebody out there that really knows about ears. You see your eyes, there must be somebody out there that really, really knows about eyes. So you got an intelligent de designer. It's just like, see, that's why uh, evolution is really 
uh, a person is showing themselves as a fool. Yeah, because uh, let's just take your cell phone. Take your cell phone. Take your cell phone. You got a cell phone here. This cell phone just didn't pop up in existence one day. Somebody had to design this cell phone. Somebody had to, to, to think, put a lot of thinking into coming up with a cell phone. Yeah. The cell phone just didn't appear. All of these parts in this phone didn't just start coming together. The battery in the phone didn't come together with a lot of the other instruments and whatever in this phone. No, you had an intelligent designer that put this cell phone together. In the same way, this world just didn't show up on its own. No, you had an intelligent designer that put this world together. That's the, uh, the teleological argument. Then you have the ontological argument. That's the third argument that basically says God must exist because man universally believe he exists. I don't care where you go, there's people saying that there's a God and they point to the sky. There's a big God, the God of the sky. They, uh, there's a God. There's a God. Where, wherever you go, you can go in the bush <laughs> in Africa, the darkest, and people believe that there's a God. So that's the ontological argument. And then the moral argument, the fact that man come here knowing right from wrong, there must be a God that knows right from wrong. And again, Psalm 94 and 10 says, he who chasten the nation shall not he correct, and he who teaches man knowledge shall not he know, shall not he know. So if God is telling man right from wrong, then there must be an intelligent guy, uh, I'm sorry, because we sure don't want to refer to God as a guy. That must be an intelligent person that really knows about right from wrong since you know about right from wrong. Yeah. And so that's the moral argument. And so those are the four traditional arguments that has been around for a long, long time. But let's move on. And then there's the knowledge from nature. Then there's the knowledge from nature. There's the knowledge from just what you see out there in nature. Romans 1 and 20. Uh, I touched on it earlier, but let's break it down here. Romans 1 and 20 says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Yeah, yeah. The, the invisible things. Of him. Let me read that again. The invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. Listen, in other words, the way you understand the invisible is by understanding the visible. You know, see, the reason we know about mansions in heaven is because they are mansions on earth. The reason we know about the streets are paved with gold there in heaven is because we see streets down here. We know what a street look like down here. And so the visible things 
help us to understand the invisible thing. You got a mind, you got a heart, you got a will, you got a body that help us understand God. God, so since you got a mind, there must be a greater mind. God's got a greater mind. Since you got a heart and you know how to love, there, there must be an invisible person who's got a greater heart than your heart. And so this is what this is saying here. The things that are seen, uh, the invisible things are understood by the things that we see. Even God and the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about the Trinity later on. I'm not going to get into the Trinity tonight. So you are uh, a person is without an excuse, without an excuse. You can look at nature. Nature tells you that there is a God. I mean, look at just how big that sky is. That tells you that there is a God. Look over here at Romans. I'm sorry, I keep wanting to say Romans, but it's Psalms 19, 1 through 6. It says, the heavens declares the glory of God. The fear mid shows his handiwork. When you just look at the, the stars and the sky, God said, that's just my little handiwork. That's just my little light stuff. Yeah. Day on the day of the speech, night shows knowledge. There is no speech, no language where their voice is not heard. Yeah, the sky is everywhere. The sun, the moon, the stars, all of that is speaking for God. That God exists. Their line is gone out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoice like a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the ends of heaven and his circuit unto the end of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Notice God says the sun comes out every morning just like a, a bridegroom is coming out. He says it's coming out of this chamber. You know, when you go to a wedding, uh, you know the wedding is, is starting now. Not when you see the bride come down the aisle. No, but it's most of the time you see the bridegroom. When you see the, the bridegroom come out from the back, back there, and he come up there and he stand next to the preacher. You know that the wedding done started now. Yeah, in the same way, uh, uh, God says that the, uh, the sun come up in the morning. He says, come up just like a bridegroom come up. Yeah, and then he says, it goes down. And he says, regardless where he goes, that sun goes. That sun in the sky, people can feel its heat. I don't care where it's at, they can feel this heat. You go to Africa, you can feel the heat of the sun. You go to Asia, you can feel the heat of the sun. You go to Hawaii, you can feel the heat of the sun. I don't care where you go, you can feel the heat of the sun. And people know that there is a God. How do they know it's God? Because they know man couldn't make that sun. They knew man can't make the moon. They know man can't make no stars and ain't never made no stars. Only a powerful being could have done that. And everywhere you go, people know a powerful being done done that. They may not know his name, but they know that there is a God. Yeah, so nature, nature itself. But then the last thing, scripture, scripture knowledge. Scripture knowledge, 
scripture knowledge, scripture knowledge lets you know that there is a God. Scripture knowledge lets you know that there is a God. Second Corinthians 4 and 6, 2 Corinthians 4 and 6 tells us, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness have shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. And so it's God, his word, he gives you some light. When you read your Bible, then you get light. You get the light and the truth regarding God. You get the truth regarding God. You get to know the name of God. You get to know the power of God. You get to know the ways of God because of the light. This word is a light. Then uh, 2 Peter 1.19 says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy unto which ye do well uh, that ye take heed as unto a light that shine in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your heart. And so again, we take heed to this Bible. Why do we pay attention to the Bible? Because paying attention to the Bible, you're paying attention to a, a light. God can shed light uh, on different subjects. Even God, see, the, uh, this book is to teach us about God. This book is all about God. God is on every page. That's why uh, uh, Jesus, when he was talking to those people uh, after he had raised, was risen from the grave on that Emmaus road, and he found them two men in Luke 24 on the Emmaus road. And the Bible says, beginning with Moses all the way uh, through the prophets, he began to teach them things pertaining to himself. And so the whole Bible is about God. It's about Jesus. If, if you find that people ain't talking about Jesus, they're not talking about God, because God is the subject of the whole Bible, then uh, they must be preaching the wrong Bible. They ain't talking the right thing. But let's go on. And so we see the four ways, the four ways we see by uh, four ways. How do we know that God exists? Number one, by intuition knowledge. If you come here knowing. Let me, see, you have to be deprogrammed to believe that there is no God. Yeah, you have to be. God send you here program to believe that there is a God, but people have to deprogram you. Yeah. And, and, and to, uh, not believe in God. Then there's the four traditional arguments on God. And then by knowledge from nature, nature, let us know that there's God and then scripture, let us know that there is a God. How should we apply the lesson? Number one, number one, don't be a fool. Don't, don't, I'm sorry, don't become. Let me just use that. Don't become a fool. Don't become a fool. Don't become a fool. See, as I said earlier, man come to this world believing in God. But you can go around these educated people who don't want to obey God, who don't want to listen to God. Then they'll start teaching you to doubt in the existence of God. As a result, you become a fool. You don't come here, fool. You become a fool. So don't become a fool. But number two, don't 
listen to a fool. Don't listen. Don't listen to a fool. When you see that you are around a fool, the Bible tells us to get away. When you perceive that, that this person is foolish, the Bible tells you to get away. Because if you listen to a fool, then you're going to become a fool. So uh, don't uh, listen to a fool. And then show others that you are not a fool. Show others that you are not a fool. And the way that you do that, you keep reading your Bible. You keep studying your Bible. You keep coming to church. Uh, uh, you keep doing those things that are becoming of a Christian. Yeah, you keep praising the Lord. You keep worshiping the Lord. Because the more that you praise God, uh, when, as they say, when the praises go up, uh, God comes down. Yeah, and you, you can feel that joy will just fill your soul. And so show, show the world, show this world that there is a God. Show others that you are not a fool. All right, that's our lesson for the night. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word. Take this word and use it to bring honor and glory to your holy and righteous name. Lord, I, I pray for the sick and the shed in. Those that are sick, touch their bodies, heal their bodies, make their bodies hold again. And then, Lord, if there are those that need jobs or finances, Lord, fix it, dear God, where they can get good jobs. Fix it, Lord, where you'll send even some extra income to those who already have jobs, but they just need a little bit extra. So send a little bit extra, and we'll be careful to praise you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. All right, that's it for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Now stay encouraged. Stay encouraged, and we'll see you on Sunday.